Today's guest is the creator of the hit BBC drama, Peaky Blinders. The impetus for do with Peaky was stories that my mum and dad told me when I was a kid. What I don't want to do is make, isn't it a shame for these poor working class people? You know, didn't they have a terrible time, wasn't it awful? So bad, you know, the drinking and fighting and all that stuff, it's glamorous stuff. This is, and this is in Brum, you know, this is absolutely part of Birmingham history that never gets told that that is a drama. It's like a Western. You know, I've been a blues fan since I was born. My parents were blues fans. All grandparents were blues fans. It strikes me that we got lucky. These new owners mean it. Doing the right thing about the city, about Birmingham. And it's like an engine that starts to work within the club and the community where everybody starts bouncing off each other. And if you can get that right, that's the thing that's going to lift us up to where we all know we should be. Rooney has been sacked by Birmingham City. I think it was a brave decision to act quickly. I just didn't think that it was a fit. Whereas Mowbray, you know, he's funny and is aware of the absurdity of life, which is what Blues fans are as well. He understands football fans who are not fans of a club like Liverpool or Man City. Fans of a club like us are there for reasons that defy logic. Hello and welcome back to the Blues Focus podcast with today's very special guest. As usual, I'm happy to be joined by Jamie Lawler. You're right. Zach Woods. Hello, everybody. And Sam Sheppey. Hi, guys. Uh, no camera, but still here in voice. <laughs> <laughs> today's guest is the creator of the hit BBC drama Peaky Blinders, set in the hard working city of Birmingham from 1919 to 1933. The show is easily one of the most stylish and iconic of TV programmes, starring multiple Hollywood celebrities in Killian Murphy, Tom Hardy, and Adrian Brody, to mention a few. In 2020, he was awarded a CBE for his services to drama and entertainment and the wider work in the Birmingham community, a CBE, a screenwriter, film producer and director, but most importantly, he's a big blues fan. Please welcome Stephen Knight. Hello, good to be here. It's very good to have you on. It's absolutely delighted to have you on. Um, but yeah, this podcast has been a, a few months in the making. Uh, we first met back in August uh, before the first home game of the season against Leeds in the uh, in the Roost in the pub. Obviously, what an amazing day that turned out to be. It was, uh, I mean, it was just buzzing before the game even got kicked yeah. off with. Tom Brady, the fireworks, all the tributes to Trevor Francis as well, which was very touching. Uh, but since then, it obviously has been a bit of a bumpy ride. But taking you back to that day, I mean, what's your best memories of that day, really? It was just amazing. I mean, you know, I think like a lot of Blues fans, things started to happen on that day that we never thought would ever happen. Like Tom Brady's not going to walk into the roost. You know, not ever. That's just not going to happen. And it did um and but i mean there was an occasion before that in baines's where i think it was the last game of the previous season where um tom wagner and his people arrived um and uh, tom wagner came up to the bar and he was heaving because it was the last game um and he put his car behind the bar and said buy everybody a drink and the barmaid thought he meant everybody who just walked in with him mm said, no, 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 he means everybody in the pub. She said, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> it, was just like, it was so, so brilliant. And then on that day in the roost when um, they all show up and in advance of that, I thought I'd better get a drink in for them. And I foolishly bought, I mean, there, there wasn't a great deal of choice. So I've got them all, um, I think I've got about 20 Budweiser's. And when they got there, they go, they're like, what's this? We want Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. and Guinness. So I think this is part of Tom's, um, you know, health and nutrition. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's it's all so exciting at the moment. I mean, just small stories like that show the difference between previous owners we've had and oh. these guys that have come in. I mean, what are your thoughts? Just everything going on off the pitch? Because I mean, even small details. We've had the stands now renovated, but even like yeah. fresh licks of paint, renovated yeah. changing rooms. I mean, how how fantastic a job are the new owners doing? It's brilliant. And, uh, you know, I, I was sort of 
privy to, to conversations in advance of the whole thing happening. And I thought, this can't, this, this isn't going to happen. Something's going to go wrong. It's blues, you know. It's never going to work. And the Chinese owners were, I mean, some of the stories which I, which I sadly can't share about the, the, the sort of labyrinthine negotiations that went on with the previous owners and the madness and, and the hilarious things that were happening, um, which, you know, I think the the Americans just dealt with because I, that, they're used to this sort of stuff, you know. They they do deal in distressed assets, and God knows we were a distressed asset. Mm. Uh, and they dealt with it. They had patience and they had fortitude and got it done. And then when it actually happened, you just thought, you know, I've been a blues fan since I was born because if my parents were blues fans, all grandparents were blues fans, um, and probably their parents were blues fans. I don't know. So there was nothing I could do about it. Um, and my kids are all blues fans as well now. But um, the idea that the thing that we've always thought can't happen might happen mm. is so bewildering at first. You just think, oh my God, this going to happen. And then, of course, we do the blues thing. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> just all up immediately. It's like, oh no, this is going too well. Now, I think we've got somebody who it seems to me there's there's an unusual. I mean, I read Small Heath Alliance a lot, and I've never known a consensus, yeah, like that. Small Heath mm. Alliance because everybody, you know, everybody want everybody's got their own opinion and stuff. And, and by the way, Small Heath Alliance is brilliant, and I think it's yeah. there. Mm. <laughs> it's just inspired humor and stuff but um to see the consensus around tony mowbray is really great so i suppose Stephen, my next question is obviously you're in and around the club a little bit like you said so have you met any of the players and with that do you have a favorite that you uh, i don't get to meet the players much um they're all so young you know they're, they're younger than my kids and it's quite strange that, and I, i've always found i've found this for years because I, I usually go to the jasper carrot sweet and you get the man of the match and like when we've lost four nil <laughs> and the poor man of the match gets dragged in you think oh you poor sod yeah. um, but you know it's like when the horse Jeff Horsfield used to come in and he was like a skinny kid whereas on mm. the pitch he looks like this great big lumbering bloke it's it's very different so the players in fact I did meet him when I'm, I invited a lot of the players to the Peaky Ballet thing in Birmingham and you know they're great they're real laugh and I don't know what the current thoughts are on Craig Gardner but he's a brilliant bloke mm. and, and and the people that I meet behind the scenes are fantastic and previously I've always given them a peaky hat but I stopped doing that because it kept going wrong so I've been talking to a lot of people around you know behind the scenes and it strikes me that we got lucky in that these new owners mean it yeah in terms of doing the right thing about the city, about Birmingham, about the community, Small Heath, Borsley and all of that. Not least because I think they understand that doing the right thing is actually profitable. Mm, you know, 100%. It's, not like, it's not like, let's be nice. Well, it is being nice, but being nice also creates that mood and that atmosphere. And it's like an engine that starts to work within within the club and the community where everybody starts bouncing off each other. And, and if you can get that right, that's the thing that's going to lift us up to where we all know we should be as the, mm -hmm. the club that carries the name of the second biggest city in britain that's where yeah. we, should be. we should be up there so what we need is money first um owners who understand and then i think it's our job us as blues fans to get on board and bring as many people as we can with us to the game fill that stadium uh and then I'm doing what I can. We're all doing what we can to sort of connect the club to the to the area and to that bit of Birmingham and then the bigger bit of Birmingham and just make sure that people identify with the football team as representatives of something more than just a football team, I think. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, because, I mean, I, I went to the um, the open house. That was what they called it. Oh, yeah. and, and just the little projects that they had lined up for the club, it showed that they meant yeah. it, you know. And obviously... Yeah. Rooney's been and gone now and he's obviously had his time with us and now Mowbray's the new manager. It's still, the, the ideas that they've got for the club, you know, the yeah. and the renovations they've given us already, you know, it yeah. just shows that the, it's like you say, like pride and passion, it, it's profitable, you know, and staying loyal to yeah. your customers, you know, and I don't think we've had that as a football club before and it's kind of mm. a weird feeling for us to have. 
Oh, no. mm. We're customers now, not victims, which we've been for <laughs> like 30 years. And I do think that you know, there's something good about the American model. I know we can all have our views about that, but the, the American model of let's treat people as customers and let's give them a, a good experience. You know, it can be as cynical as you want, but that's what we all want. The main thing about the experience is you've got to win. Mm. You know, and I, I, that was the first thing I was saying to everybody that I met is that all of this is absolutely fantastic, but mm. you can have the worst match day experience. If you win 3 0, you're happy. Mm. Got to get it right on the pitch. And that's what I mean, you know, they do get it because they're sports people as well. And mm. you know, to Tom Brady, he completely understands. There's nothing worse than when we lose, as we mm. all know. You know, mm. Saturday night when we've lost is horrible. There's um, been too many of those in recent years. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the recent couple of weeks. But maybe I think that maybe the recent couple of weeks is like to our new owners, this is what it's like. Yeah, um, don't let it keep on happening because it will yeah, keep on slipping, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the sort of points you make there, if you if you go to a, a match day game now compared to, you know, a few years back, mm -hmm. you're right in that there's so much that's improved. The food's better, even though it's the programmes are looking great these days. As yeah. we've said, like the fireworks before the game, it, yeah. it's a rarity as Blues fans because everything off the pitch and surrounding the actual football itself has improved tenfold. Yeah. And, and bear in mind, they haven't been here years yet. They've been here no, exactly. a couple of months. So just to see that intent and... And you only need to listen to Gary Kirk or, or Tom Wagner yeah. speak for 10 minutes to know that yeah. they know exactly what they're doing and exactly yeah. what they're talking about. And as Blues fans, that's just so lovely to see because it's something in recent history we've been yeah. deprived of, really. And it, it's one that, I mean, I think the way I look at it is that um, there's no Blues fans who were there because they're glory hunters. <laughs> God, <You know>? okay. <laughs> there isn't a single one. I can't. 99.9% no. .9 of the fans are there because their one of their parents was a blues fan and that parent was a blues fan because their grandparents almost certainly were blues fans so what you've got in i think in in the the, the blue support is i bet that my grandparents and great grandparents lived within a stone's throw of the parents and grandparents and grandparents of most of the people who went who were there because they would have come from that particular area which wasn't big really it was crowded, but it wasn't vast. So you've got, you know, your small Ethy Bordsley and, and, and all of that South Birmingham stuff. The Birmingham city support, it's, it's almost tribal. It's almost like these are people who have been stuck with this allegiance for 100 years, you know, yeah. and we're the next generation. And the thing that I'm really passionate about is because, as, as I say, I've made, not made them, but all my kids sport blues. And... I just don't want that to be a burden for them. I was living in London and my oldest son was at school in London and he was seven and he came home and he was crying. And I said, what's the matter? He said, um, I was at school today and somebody said, who do you support? And I said, Birmingham City. And he said, there's no such thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a horrible thing. To say. <laughs> we were bad, but we weren't that bad. But the, the thing that was like the taster of what could possibly be like, you know, 2011, the League Cup final. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, and the thing happened that never happens. Like, we go one up, they equalise. So, obviously, we're going to get towards extra time. Yeah, of course, they're going to beat us in extra time. And then that happened. Mm. Mm. Did you and go? Said, oh, God, yeah. I went with probably about 20 members of my family. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> a big family in every sense, like kids. And I'm one of the youngest of seven kids as well. And we're all Blues fans, so... And their kids are all Blues fans. And we all used to go when I was little. But, you know, we we're at that match. And the first thing I said to um, Joe and Ed was like, this this doesn't happen. This never mm -hmm. happened. And even then, after that, you're expecting them to equalise. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Oh, that like, oh, God. That, was, <laughs> that, that was by far one of the greatest days I think yeah. I'll witness in a long time as a Blues fan. Oh, I think the my best day, isn't it? Oh, best day. it was. <laughs> well, I'm hoping your generation, you've got lots of them to come. Um, fingers crossed yeah <laughs> can't be any worse than the last few years can <laughs> it? no i was gonna say well this is this is the thing as well since we've come down from the premier league we just haven't really had any recent success at all not even like a like a, a an outside the playoff finish we've just been deprived of any success which i guess is a good point to segue on to tony mowbray and a little bit about rooney as well we'll start with rooney given that you know all that's just happened yeah. i mean 
it, it obviously sadly didn't work. Some saying 15 games wasn't enough, deserved a bit more time. I mean, what are your thoughts on the whole Rooney situation? I think um, it was a brave decision to to act quickly. I, I just didn't think that it was a fit. Mm. Didn't yeah. feel like, even for, I mean, I was all guns blazing to say we've got to support because we have, you know, once you've appointed the manager, you've got to get behind the manager. There's no point just immediately moaning about it. But Blues are funny. To, every supporter thinks their club is, is unique. And of course, every club is unique. But we've got our own sort of way of doing things. Um, and that didn't feel that it was going to work. Just like the Zola thing, you know. It, yeah. It, feel as if this was a, a natural ingrained thing that we would do and whereas Mowbray you know is funny and is aware of the absurdity of life and all of that which is what Blues fans are as well I think mm. and he's not going to get too big for his boots it, it, he understands football um, I think he understands not just Blues fans but football fans in general who are not fans of a club like Liverpool or Man City or whatever fans of a club like us are there for reasons that defy logic. Yeah. Mm. You know, there's no... I think you're right to highlight the character of Mowbray there as well, because, yeah. you know, someone that can really sort of, you know, have that funny side to him where we've seen like, in press conferences and that he has a bit of, you know, that character to him. And he's yeah. also someone that's got a lot of experience in the game as well. So in terms of sort of, you know, like getting the team sort of back on the same page together, yeah. what would you say is the main thing you've got to focus on to try and get that confidence back? I think confidence is such an important word in football. I, I, you know, I, I've never been any good at football. Um, I'm not an expert in football tactics or anything like that. I just want to win mm. desperately, desperately, probably more than is acceptable for somebody of my age. I can't <laughs> lose. I can't stand it. You know, on the days, it's, it's it's one of those things. And I would hope we're watching players who feel the same. They can't stand to lose. In that, you're mm. right. when you look at. Ferguson and, and going back to like Matt Busby and Bill Shanky and people like that, they took over clubs that were middling. People forget that, like Liverpool, Man U, were they were okay, you know, they were nothing special. And then these characters came along, who would not accept defeat. They wouldn't. Hmm. So suddenly those two clubs became what they became. And I think you know you can be grown up about it, you can try to be grown up about it, um, but I just I like the idea that what we should be is not accepting of defeat. Yeah, it's been a long-standing sort of tradition with the Blues, really. It's like the phrase typical Blues sort of stems from it, doesn't it? Where yeah. it's like, we've, we've lost the game, we probably should have won it. It's our it's typical Blues to throw it away. But it's like the the mentality I think Gary Cook and the board are trying to install yeah. now. It's like, well, no, we should we should want to win those games. We should be bitterly yeah. disappointed when we've lost Absolutely. those games. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I'm all for having a part after and in the end it wears off, but in that 90 minute or 100 minutes these days, it, there's got to be an absolute refusal to mm. accept mm. anything other than victory. Because then once that, I think once it starts happening, then it becomes a habit, you know, and, and mm. start losing. once we start doing okay and things start to click. I, I mean, I've been there when we've been good and when we got promoted. And the, the other problem with that is you get used to that as well. Remember on the odd occasions when we've been really good, you sort of get used to it. And we're in the prep and we're playing Man U, we're playing Arsenal. No, we lost to Arsenal. This is terrible. Mm. But you forget to put it in context. But I want us to get into that situation again where you take your kids to the match and they're watching quality yeah. against exactly. the, the big opposition. Because why not? We we are a big club. We're half of Birmingham. In we really are, yeah. That's a big chunk of people. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think even the managerial decisions that have been made in the past, you know, to get rid of Eustace for Rooney and to get rid of Rowett for Zola, each time that decision's made, because prior to those decisions being made, we were picking up results. But yeah, these yeah. managers have been sat because maybe the football isn't too pretty or, mm -hmm. you know, we want to play more attacking or no fear footballers, as they worded it. So mm -hmm. whilst we were picking up results, the reason for these decisions is we want to be that modern, attacking, mm -hmm. fast paced football club that, mm -hmm. yes, are picking up the results, but are also doing it in a way which is entertaining to fans mm, which yeah, I think in some aspects you know has, has been detrimental I think this is where it's been good that the owners have almost gone back on their yeah. initial part because it'd be so easy to go out and get a, a Frank Lampard and, and try and do the same thing yeah. you know a big name and try and play that football but yeah. 
I think, again, where it shows how good our owners are is they've learnt from their mistakes. They're now getting in a manager who's got that experience in the championship, knows it like the back of his hand, has experienced success and might not be the biggest name in the world, but he's a man that will hopefully start to get us results. Exactly. And uh, uh, you know, the, the importance of winning, it's obviously, I mean, everybody knows it's self-evident, but for me, the entertainment is winning. Hmm. Um, and if, if it's the case, which it actually probably is, if it's the case that playing fast flow and entertaining football makes you more likely to win, happy days. Mm. You know, and, and that seems to be the case in the Prem, but we've got to make sure that we know what we're doing in order to just get that result at the end of it. Yeah, because what would you say that um, a success would be sort of at the end of the season with Tony Mowbray coming in now with us in 20th place? What would you say would be the success for this season? Win the FA Cup. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I, mean, I, I don't know. Um, probably, and again, it, it, it pains me to say, let's accept this, but realistically, it's probably mid-table is fine. You know, um, if we can start to threaten the playoffs, then fantastic. There's no reason why not. There's plenty of time left, I think. Mm. A cup run would be nice. Mm. Um, I, I, yeah, when is the next round? I can't next remember. round should be in February, I believe. Now, we beat Hull, obviously. Yeah, yeah exactly. The replay yeah. first, and then the easy yeah. task of Leicester away next up. Yeah, I would. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, a, a, a cut run would be good. I think a cut run would be an interesting thing this season because if if one accepts, which I don't necessarily, but if one accepts, we're not going to get into the playoffs, then it would be mm. something. To look at. Do you know what I mean? It would be something. Mm for us to test ourselves against some bigger clubs and maybe have some fun. There are quite a few Blues references in Peaky Blinders. Uh, and uh, obviously, there is one in the very first episode. Uh, Grace is obviously speaking to Harry behind the bar at the garrison. And so he's always just busy in the, in the daytime. He says, now these these lads are off to St Andrews. You know, the Blues are playing. Last no, says, says, he, says, he says St Andrews and she says, is that a church? <laughs> he says, is that a church? He says, no, the Blues are playing. You know, they're not going to pray or anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and of course, in the last season as well, when they, they're trying to threaten the ref to uh, throw yeah. the game and give a penalty. Uh, which he still doesn't. Uh, you've worked some realism well into there, actually. I think that's uh, yeah, yeah. decent on your part. But... <laughs> I mean, but like, how much influence does Blues have on you writing for Peaky Blinders? Because I imagine the sort of working class feel doesn't definitely plays into it. Yeah, it's it's absolutely all part of the same thing. I mean, I've said it many times, but the the uh, impetus for doing it for for doing Peaky was stories that my mum and dad told me when I was a kid about their lives when they were kids and mm. when my mum was nine years old she was a bookies runner mm. because it was illegal. betting was illegal so my, she lived in little green lanes and she used to walk down little green lanes with um, a basket of washing and people would walk in the other direction and they'd have the name of the horse they were betting on their code name and the bet like sixpence and they'd drop it in the wash and my mum would walk down the street taking all these bets at the end of the street there was a bookie called tucker rise he was apparently a massive fat bloke and he had a, a dog on a chain that was just short enough so you could get past him wow. and she walked past him with the basket of washing and take it her and her dad was a gambler and well everybody was a gambler then mm. um and my dad's uncles were the sheldons for some reason the bbc wouldn't let me call them sheldons they said you've mm. got to change the name as if these gangsters from the 1920s was going to get offended and sue us <laughs> defamation yeah <laughs> yeah exactly how dare you um they were as i say my dad's uncles and no matter what you may read that people say about oh there were no peaky blinders after 1900 and stuff in small heath and Bordesley, they were known as the peaky blinders mm. and my dad told a story where his dad um all blues fans were there. my granddad uh was at the storm and was shot with a dum dum bullet, which is illegal now, but it's a bullet that explodes inside. So there oh, were yeah. bits of shrapnel in his body until 1968. He used to cut our hair when we were kids, so I remember him, and he was always in pain. But anyway, that's another story. But he was a First World War veteran, and he one time said to my dad, "Take this message to your uncles, the Sheldon." My dad was terrified, so he's barefoot. My dad running down. He, he, they were in Sandy Lane off Watery Lane. And he goes to where they live and knocks on the door. And he said, the door opened. There's this waft of cigarette smoke, whiskey and beer. And he looks in and there's a round table covered in coins because they've taken all the bets. And he said, there's about 
seven blokes sitting around it, immaculately dressed, with like the caps and the top, and everything, the boots are shining, and they're drinking whiskey out of jam jars <laughs> because they wouldn't spend any of that money on something like glasses. Do you know what I mean? That's cup. amazing, that is. And, if, and, and that, that story was the thing that made me want to do it because mm. the, all obviously the blokes were all veterans from the first world war so they were all pretty screwed up from experiences that they had but wouldn't let on yeah would never show that emotion would never talk about it my granddad never talked about it and you got these men and in an age where it's about it's sort of unfashionable that sort of thing that we're talking about but you know here are these men who are like statues drinking mm. running a gambling organization i just thought this is and this is in brum you know this is own this is absolutely part of Birmingham history that never gets told and so I just thought that that is a drama it's like a western you know it is very much like a western yeah. actually I've well, that. and what I wanted to do is like when my parents witnessed all of this they're little kids you know and the garrison door opens and the garrison is like this theatre this cathedral for them so it's a it's a myth for them and then they tell me and I'm a kid when they tell me so it's doubly mythologized and when yeah. I went to do it I thought what I don't want to do is much isn't it a shame for these poor working class people you know didn't they have a terrible time wasn't it awful so that you know the people were having a laugh and and that was most of the stories about the, the laughter and the and you know drinking and fighting and all that stuff it's glamorous stuff so I wanted to make it the mythology mm. of, of Birmingham and why not and you have to get over that well I can't make this glamorous because it's Birmingham well you can yeah you know, reason why not it's the same as chicago or philadelphia or anywhere else you know i think because I, when i was doing my research for you into this podcast i, I remember you, you you said that uh story to talk radio i think it was before yeah. the release of the fourth series back in the yeah. uh back in 2017 i just remember thinking though that that is just peaky blinders like to a yeah. t like you can see all yeah. the imagery in that room as when the first in the very first series when they're still living in the uh near the garrison line pub yeah you, you, that that front room is so small because you know it's sort of what they can that they had yeah. at the time but like i mean the music that you use in it as well like you use a lot of nick cave and the bad seeds obviously that's like you know the theme tune is obviously red right hand and everything but like i mean it, it's weird to use modern music well modern music in a way but like it's it, it makes the it makes the scenery better it makes the yeah. it makes the show feel more uh, attractive to a, a more of a modern yeah. audience well with the, with the first series it was when it was being cut together, we got quite a good group of editors working on it, post-production people, and they used to put modern tracks to it when they were editing to get mm. the rhythm. And it just worked so well. And so we just thought, well, let's do that then. And, and mm. what's been great about it is that after probably series two, a lot of music artists liked the show, and they were offering us their music for less than BBC right you know and and so we were spoiled for choice because we got a, a really good dedicated group of really cool music artists who they were just really good and so we were able to use the music and the more it happened the more it happened and then Snoop Dogg said uh, this was I think series four after series four Snoop Dogg came to uh England and his agent said that he wanted to meet me because he was a big peaky fan. So we met in this in St. Martin's Lane Hotel. He couldn't go to the bar, so I'd go to his room. And he's building this thing that he's going to smoke. It's like this big. And I'm drinking beer. And he's just talking about his life and how... And this is the weird thing. He saw in Peaky Blinders echoes of how he got involved in gang culture. And you think, well, how can that be? So this is South Central LA, and this is Birmingham in the 20s. But there's something, um, you know, some shows are lucky, and I think Peaky is lucky, is that there's something about it that seems to resonate with a lot of people, and music artists seem to be prominent amongst them. It seems like a lot of Peaky Blinders is not only for yourself, but other people as well, based off sort of real life experiences, or can somewhat relate to it, and that seems crazy given the amount of, like, violence and gang culture we see in, in the show. It, 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 so is a lot of what was written it, obviously not all of it but are parts of it based off real life experiences then is a lot of it research what's the show sort of centered around i guess it's the characters are based on real people like charlie strong when i was my dad was a farrier a blacksmith so he used to shoe horses and he had a mobile forge and um when i was a kid we'd wake up in the morning my dad would say do you want to go to school or do you want to come with me so some of us would get in the van and we'd go out to these places where he's shooting horses and there was a lot of quite you know 
respectable riding stables and stuff. But he also used to go to a lot of scrap metal yards uh, with a lot of Romani people. And um, Charlie Strong was one of me. He was in Nietzsche's, um And he, he, there was a bloke called Curly who worked with him, who was my, I found out later, was my great uncle. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and I, they were just the most amazing people. So imagine you're a kid and you're not going to school and you're driving into the big metal doors open and you're driving to the scrap metal yard in Neutrals and there's a fire going and somebody's cooking bait and an egg on it and there's all these interesting characters and stuff. And you go in there and the horses are there and your dad starts shit. I used to turn the handle on the forge to, to get the coal hot. And they were just such a lot. Like I used this line in, in the series where I said to my dad once, I said, is, is this stuff stolen and my dad said no 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 he said charlie finds things just before they're lost <laughs> <laughs> that is a brilliant line that is fantastic. <laughs> and, but they were all like that they were hilarious and you know really this would be the late 60s early 70s so i think i glimpsed the end of a sort of victorian birmingham mm. um where there were still horses and carts and things um and that's how i shaped the series so i put charlie strong in it i put curly in it polly was my dad's auntie um and so i grew up with stories about aunt polly who was like really good with her fists and all so it's not so much events because i'd run you'd run out of events quite quickly but it's more the characters and who they are and how they were and something about the way men were as well especially mm. uh, following on from like zach's question about sort of you know like research and everything you say, you say there about sort of, you know, having those ideas to start off with and then kind of branching off. How much of, you know, do you have to balance between fiction and also what happens in real life too? I think, I mean, you've got to go for fiction. You've got, I mean, you've got to tell a story that's entertaining. So um, I, I will absolutely follow a drama story, you know, and, and have a good and bad, and bad character who becomes good or a good character who becomes bad and all that stuff that is hopefully interesting. Any research I did, I used to look at old copies of the Birmingham Mail. And I recommend that to anybody, rather than reading the history book. Because it, it, history books, I think what people, what, it, and it's their job, so I wouldn't know. But they, I think they tend to take events and then look at them as if what eventually happened was inevitable. So that happened, that happened, that happened. So obviously, therefore, that would happen. But I don't think history is like that. It's chaos. You know, We all know real life is chaotic. Mm. And if you read that, the Birmingham Mail from the 1920s, things like, and my, I remember my dad telling me about this. He said, because he was quite uh, quite left-wing when he was young. Not when he was older, but when he was young. Um, and he said that he'd be in the ball ring and some bloke would put a box down and he'd stand on the box and he'd start talking about communism and revolution. Mm. And he said the police would come, take him to Steelhouse Lane, and he'd never be seen again. Wow. And it's like, wow. And then, you know, you think, well, maybe he's, misremembered but then i looked at uh the birmingham and there's a case there's some person arrested in the ballroom for sedition for what he was yeah. saying and he was given like 10 years gosh i know and and that's in like, that's not in the history book and then you know you, you read about oh it was all fine we were in each other's houses and borrowing cups of sugar and then the papers there's all these armed robberies and things and and, and the, the, actually the best bit of research i can't remember where it came from the, the, it was police records of a kid who I think was 10 years old who was arrested. And he was arrested because his mother reported him. And what had happened was his mother had given this kid, like sixpence or whatever, to go and get food for the family. And he came back with a top hat and a coconut. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, I know, sir. And it's not like help. His mom is like, what are you doing? <laughs> She's skinned. They're all skinned. So she's got this stuff out in this coconut. And so she calls the police. Oh, it is amazing. Them this, and it's a, it's a police report. The boy, you know, bought a top hat and a coconut. Wow. <laughs> stuff like that. I mean, that's where reality is so much more interesting than anything that anybody like me can make up, you know. Mm. Yeah. And, and I guess you forget a lot of these things. It wasn't that long ago. We're talking 100 no. years ago, you know. It's, it doesn't, it's not, you know, 1650, only 100 years ago. I mean, in terms of the show and everything, let's talk, I guess, a little bit about the characters and, and, and all that. Tommy Shelby, he's obviously the main character in the show, but one of the biggest characters in TV now. D did you expect him as a character and I guess the show as a whole to become quite as big as it's become? Absolutely not, no. And it, it's, um, it is, continues to be astonishing to me that, you know, I get people sending me photos from Buenos Aires and from 
China and from all sorts, and they walk into a bar and there's Tommy Jelby and Arthur and Polly and all on the wall. Mm. I don't know why or how it's resonated mm. with so many people. America, I mean, the US, it's huge, and Netflix have just released some figures mm. about viewing figures, which are just, we knew it was good, but we didn't know exactly. It's just like there's a lot of people out there watching it. Um, and no, certainly didn't expect it to be like that. And, and you're right, Tommy Shelby has become this real sort of iconic. Yeah. I've heard a few stories regarding obviously Killian Murphy and how he got the voice for Tommy Shelby. Um, what's the actual, how did you come up with that kind of accent for him? How did he develop that accent? We, uh, we took him to, we being me and my mates who go to the match and two of my brothers, we took him to the Garrison pub mm. and he bought a tape recorder. I think it was a cassette recorder. That's how long ago it was. It, it brings a cassette <laughs> And the Garrison was being the Garrison. The landlord was asleep on the bar. <laughs> <laughs> like how on the bar? Like actually on the bar? On the bar yeah. Oh my god! Why it was, not? <laughs> it was the last days of Roman. It was the last days of the garrison when it was really, really, really weird. <laughs> and we went in there. So we're all there. It's probably we've got photos of it as well. There's, there's probably about ten of us all together. And what he was doing is recording people talking mm. um, to get the accent. And so we're all there talking, getting drunk and stuff. And there was a, it was a Royal Antwerp. It was a pre-season friendly against, I think it was Royal Antwerp. So we were meant to all go to the match. We didn't get to the match in him. And we're all in the pub talking, and then we start singing and all this sort of stuff. Some of my mates have friends who, who, who you know, do things that are not necessarily legal. So occasionally they'd go, turn the tape off, turn the tape off. Let me tell you the story. Gillian <laughs> um, took the tape home with him and just listened to it over and over again. And what I think he got, is and the, the, the first series we had all sorts of problems about the accent and, and understandably brummies are saying that oh, the accents are terrible it's just mm. really difficult to do mm-hmm. for an act it's that i think brummy and geordie are really tricky and the problem was we had a voice coach and what was happening was that the actors were doing their lines and the voice coach would go no 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 no, no. Oh, don't wow. and it was just getting in the way of the whole thing mm-hmm. so in the end I said, let's just get rid of the voice coach let's worry about the accent it's not going to be perfect, but let's do the performance first. Mm. And, then, and you know, the, the defence that you put up is, I remember my grandparents' accent was very different to yeah. my grandparents' accents even. It was very different. So who knows what they sound like and all of that. But, um, you know, some of those accents did grind away a bit. But Killian had got, I think, from meeting people, the speed of it. Mm. For some reason, when yeah. people are in Brummie, they slow down. I don't know why. And if you go at it fast, which he did, just keep doing it then I think, you know, that's how you get it. But it is a very difficult accent. What was Killian like to work with then? Because he's, he's a, obviously a massive name now, so what, what was he like? He still is, was then, and hopefully always will be, just the best bloke. He really is. Mm. He's absolutely, and I'm not just saying that, he's, he leads the line in terms of the actors. You know what I mean? The filming is hard work. And it's, it, it's, it's, it's a lot of time and people get exhausted and things. It's quite an intense thing to be on a set for like 12 weeks and you're all working together. So there's mm. ups and downs, but we've been really lucky with the people we've got because it's been successful. We've lost actors who have been offered other stuff uh, and there's nothing we could do about it. Cause what we didn't do is what the Americans do, which is tie everybody into a contract that keeps them there for 10 years. So I've had to, you know, write the death of characters. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Really want to write um, because they'd got another job. Well, John was the big one, I think, in the end of season three or start of season four. I think that was right at the start, wasn't it? Where, like, literally, <laughs> you're like, bang, straight into the series. It's a great it's way like, to start. Happened. And you're like, <laughs> actually, it act- to me, like, yeah, it actually sometimes it's a, it's a good thing because it makes you do something that you wouldn't want to do. So it's unexpected. And everybody goes, oh my God. Mm. Yeah, it's a complete yeah. twist. Like, I remember watching it just thinking, like, oh my word, like, what's happening here? <laughs> Chuck straight into it. <laughs> And in, in terms of the way Peaky Blinders rounded up, we obviously saw the death of Michael and then a lot of you got a lot of praise for the way it was all rounded up as a series, a really nice ending. Is there, I guess my first question to that is, are you happy with how Peaky Blinders ended and how it was wrapped not up? And I did a, a, not, that was my follow-up. Is there still more? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, we're, we're doing the film. Um, mm-hmm. So we're, we're shooting that this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and that will, for me, that will be the end of this era. Of mm. and then the door is open to do you know subsequent 
with different cast and and it'd be a different era so it'd be into the 50s i see yeah um to carry the story on you know as long as people want it mm-hmm. yeah I'm that, sure that will. i see that yeah definitely <laughs> well uh I think that is pretty much all we've got time for, actually. Uh, but yeah, Stephen, honestly, thank you so much for coming on. It's, it's been an absolute there. pleasure. Let's hope yeah. that we'll... this is for Tony Mowbray, glass of champagne. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've only got a glass of water, so I'll be <laughs> you. so yeah. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Blues Focus podcast. We will be back very soon. Uh, thank you again, Stephen, and keep right on. Keep, keep right on. on. Keep right on. Put the blue balls.